In our last session, we considered the role and nature of requirements in our design. They are the driving force behind what the system needs to be and do. It is the behavior or functions that will actually operate to satisfy the requirements, and that is our subject in this session. The system behavior is also known as the functional or logical architecture. The logical description, often referred to as the functional description, tells us what the system will do. The requirements are answered by the system functions that meet them. Thus, the logical or functional description of the system being designed is a direct answer to the needs stated in the requirements. For that reason, we say that the behavior is based on the requirements and correspondingly that the requirements are the basis of the behavior. We can see that in a given level, the behavior lies between the requirements and the physical architecture. Again, just for this session, we are tackling these activities from left to right. But in reality, as you advance your design, you will find that you will visit and revisit the domains until the level is complete. For the moment, the critical point is that we do need to be intentional about the design of the logical architecture. Initially, and for as long as possible, as we gain an understanding of the system's behavior, we want to do that without constraining ourselves by thinking about the system implementation. It is way too easy to forget about a rigorous definition of the logical architecture. As expressed by a very senior engineer in a very large company, I don't fool around with that functional stuff. I just allocate my requirements to the components. That's reflective of a fundamental misunderstanding. What the system will do either does or does not meet the requirements. If the what is wrong, it matters little how it is done. It should be pointed out that the what will be present in the system, whether it is intentionally designed in based on the requirements or defined in by the how based on the selections made around the components. The better practice, of course, is to create and use the opportunity to look at the requirements and construct the what intentionally from them. By failing to do that, we surrender our functional choices in favor of constraints produced by physical choices. Called jumping to solution, it's an all too common mistake. While a narrative description of behavior is possible, at least initially, as we uncover behavioral detail, we are going to need a graphical description for the behavior. That graphical description needs to consider the functionality of the system, as well as the inputs and outputs to the system. The graphical description of the behavior captures not only the functional activities, but the logic associated with the system's decision making and execution as it moves through the steps. This is critically important because it is the way the steps are related to each other that is the driving force behind the system results. In constructing the logical architecture, we are interested not only in the functional steps that are taken, but how they are executed as well. We call these constructs the control aspects of the behavior. We represent these as control construct, constructs that connect the functions and provide a logical path through our system. There are seven constructs in the graphical notation we will use to describe the system's behavior. In turn, these are the sequence construct, which provides functions for execution in sequence, one after the other, the concurrency or AND construct that allows for parallel execution of two or more functions, the SELECT or OR construct which requires the system to execute only one of two or more functions, the iterate construct that repeats the given function as defined by the domain set, 
the multiple exit function where multiple branches exit from a function and rejoin at an OR node. Each branch is labeled with the name of its associated exits and can contain any number of functions and control constructs. The loop construct that calls for a function or functions to repeat until an exit condition is met and the replicate construct that graphically shows a main branch within a coordination branch. This shows identical processes that operate in parallel with a coordination functional branch. These happen to be represented as SysML representations of the constructs. The structured rep versions are substantially the same. By combining these constructs, we can describe virtually any possible system's behavior. One of our engineers used to say that if you couldn't describe a behavior using them, it was probably against the law. There are a number of formal ways we can view the descriptions of behavior. Our design database should hold all the functions and their relationships, the control constructs. Different views are simply different ways of portraying whatever aspects of those functions and relationships we need to see for a specific purpose. If we are primarily concerned with the order of execution of the behaviors and who handles what, then we might select the sequence diagram. If we want to see the logical control and flow of the system function, we would likely select the functional flow block diagram or the activity diagram to represent those aspects of the logical architecture. If our concern is clearly showing the inputs and outputs to and from the functions, then the N squared diagram would be our choice. Each of these representations highlight a particular subset of what we have captured about the logical architecture and display that information in a way that highlights what we want to know. The manner of display is governed by the rules for constructing the diagram. Structured and SysML diagrams draw on the same design information. They just use different rules in constructing the views. While the control constructs weave the architectural framework on which the behavior operates, the substance of the behavior and flow are represented by functions and items. The fundamental building block of behavior is the function. It is an action taken by the system to transform an input into an output. In terms of a system's description language, the functions are the verbs that describe the action. Items represent the information passed between functions. There are two basic kinds of items, triggers and data stores. Triggers are items that convey information and have a control role of triggering a function. Data stores simply contain information that are an input but carry no control function. In a logical architecture, a function is enabled when the logic behind it in sequence is executed. This enables the next function in sequence. If no trigger is required, the function will then execute. If the function requires a trigger, it will wait until that input is received and only then will it execute. At this point, we can formalize the relationships between the behavior and the requirements. Here we can see that the requirements form the basis of functions. Use cases can be used to elicit the requirements and such use cases are elaborated by functions. Building on our discussion of functions and items, we can see the relationships between them as well. We talked about how our layered picture can create the assumption that as we drill down into the design, we move left to right from requirements to behavior to architecture. Uncovering behavior in order to resolve design issues. But we may find the need to move back and forth in the layer based on what we discover. In our example, that happened when we realized that we had not accounted for a need to screen the customers making requests 
to see if they were approved to receive the information they wanted. That called for a decision. The behavior of certifying the customers was required. The issue was whether we would build the capacity to provide that certification into the system or reach across the system boundary to a certifying authority. After consideration, the latter alternative was chosen and that decision was incorporated into the design. In this particular case, the geospatial libraries need to certify that users are able to receive imagery products will be satisfied by an external entity. Here we are representing that behavior with a function in the system that interacts with an external actor, the certification authority. Our notation allows us to show the activity performed by the system along with the activity we expect the external system to undertake. We are able to show how we expect the interaction to take place between the two systems through the use of items. Uncovering the behavior we expect for a system is difficult. To ease the process, rather than trying to identify all of the system's functionality in one go, it is recommended that threads of behavior are captured. For example, we may look for a thread of behavior that starts with an external function, which generates a system input and terminates with an external function which access, accepts the system output. The identification of threads is not a trivial task. Typically, you will want to have a theme that you're following. For example, looking at how the system interacts with external actors. Initially, you will look at straightforward threads of behavior. Once those threads have been captured and understood, threads can be elicited to represent the alternative courses of action or flows that the system will take when exceptions arise. The threads will be partitioned to identify the activities of our system and those of the external actors. We only want to put sufficient detail into our understanding and expectation of the external actor's behavior. We are not designing the external system. That's outside our system boundary. But we do need a sufficiently detailed understanding of the system context to facilitate an informed discussion with our stakeholders and to define the interaction requirements. Once the threads have been collected, they will be integrated into a complete description of the system behavior. That way, we can identify any emergent properties or adverse effects upon the system behavior. The first thread that we consider in our example considers the case where the geospatial library already has an imagery product for a customer in its inventory. The customer makes a request, the system checks its inventory and finds the product already there, it retrieves the product and provides it to the customer. The customer has input a request and received the output, the requested image. This completes a thread through the system. But what if the geospatial library does not have an imagery product in its inventory for the customer? In that case, the system tasks the image collectors to procure the image product. The collectors procure the image and send it to the system. The system formats the image for distribution, places it in the inventory where it's retrieved and sent to the customer. Combining these two simple threads gives us an integrated representation of the behavior. There are, here are the two potential paths through the system. We can then add the necessary information items. Here we have identified the items or messages that we expect the geospatial library to exchange with the external systems. Building upon the previous integrated model, 
we can represent this in our graphical notation. As we discover issues, like certifying our customers to receive particular products, we will build the necessary behavior into this structure, adding the external actors and internal behavior and items. So we have seen that the requirements are satisfied by the system behaviors. The behaviors are built into a logical architecture that provides a picture of how the system operates to produce that satisfaction. Next time, we will see how our behaviors are allocated to an implementation structure or physical architecture so that the system can perform the behaviors called for by the requirements.